Well, good morning. Welcome again to the Bethany Social Reform Presbyterian Church. We come together for Sabbath school this morning. Our lesson today is going to come to us in 1 Kings 18. So if you want to go ahead and turn there in your copies of God's Word, again, we'll be in 1 Kings 18 today for our lesson. But before we get into all that, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for this day and this time to God, especially as you give us opportunity to come to your word, to be reminded of your providential care over your covenant people. Under God, we do pray for this uh, lesson that we, the Holy Spirit would continue to use it to strengthen our understanding of you as well as our own faith. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, again, we're in 1 Kings 18, and we've been in 1 Kings 18 throughout the, um, you know, Two last couple of months uh, as we are in First Kings and Second Kings here uh, in the adult quarterly. Uh, we uh, have skipped uh, a decent bit from the last time we met. Uh, when we met last time, uh, Rehoboam had just been named king after Solomon's death. And after Solomon's death, then, of course, there was the division of the kingdoms to the north and to the south. You, know, you have the ten tribes of the north and the two tribes of the south, each becoming their own nation. Israel being the tribes up north and uh, Judah being the tribes down south. Now, as we experienced in our own time of civil war in the United States, or as my grandma would call it, the war in northern aggression, we see that the northern tribes have a habit of being more lawless. Uh, than the southern tribes. Now, that doesn't mean that God treats them different. God expects holiness out of both the north and the south. Uh, but we also see that God is continuing to show love to the northern tribes by sending them prophets. And the latter half of the book of First Kings is mainly focused upon the ministry of Elijah and later Elisha. Now, the work of Elijah... Uh, gets him in trouble with all of the kings because do kings like being told that they're doing things wrong? No. What do, what do kings like to hear? Praise, right? Kings love yes men. You know, kings love brown nosers. Kings love people who are wanting to tell them that they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Now, when we come to 1 Kings 18, the particular king is... King Ahab. Now, Ahab is king of the northern kingdom of the ten tribes of the north. Uh, he is a unique individual. He reigns in the days of Asa, king of Judah. Now, one of the things about Asa, king of Judah, is he is one of the rare good kings. However, he's not one of the good kings forever. Asa does not end his kingship well. In fact, we're told that Asa uh, ends in idolatry, in uh, apostasy, and that's its own lesson. But the time that Ahab is king is one that is not seen as a time of peace, of comfort, and of joy. Now, Ahab is probably most well known for his wife. Does anybody remember who Ahab's wife is? Jezebel, right? Now, um, if somebody was to call your wife a Jezebel, uh, how would you react to that? You know, is that a word of honor, of privilege, of thanksgiving? No. Right. What do we think of when we think of Jezebels? Harlots. Harlots, wickedness. Thrown out a window. You know, thrown out a window, right? Well, Ahab gets thrown out the window. Jezebel, right, is a description of a wife who is nagging, a wife who is, uh, is disruptive, uh, a wife who is not submissive, a wife who is using her husband to get her own way. Now, one of the major problems, of course, with Jezebel is, is she a worshiper of Jehovah? No. Right. So... Ahab's sin starts out with the fact that he has not kept the requirements of the law that Jewish men were to marry who? Jewish women. Jewish women right? And ideally, that woman was supposed to be within the tribe of uh, that uh, man. Now, 
The idea there, again, is so that when they have children, what do those children become? Godly, right? God-fearing, right? The, the, what happens to the boys on the eighth day? They get circumcised, right? The sign of the covenant continues from one generation to the other. Now, outside of the raising godly children, what's the other benefit of having a wife in this case who believes in the same God that you do? No yeah, I mean, you, you go to church together, right? You worship together. You have the same goals in life together. You uh, seek the same good together. But Elijah is here to tell us that Ahab has made a bad choice, not just in a wife, but in how he has ruled as a kingdom. Now, Elijah, as we come to 1 Kings 18, has already engaged in warning Ahab about a drought that is coming. Now, as the drought is coming, Elijah tells him that he has brought this upon himself because of his sin. Now, God often works this way. He brings judgments upon nations when they are acting in ways that are not in keeping with the law of God. Now, you know, tell me if you've uh, seen a nation like that before. Right. Uh, some would even say that our own nation fits that description, right? We have made deals with the devil in various ways. We are in uh, rebelling against God in different ways. And so should it be a surprise if uh, we had been led astray by our own Ahabs? Right. You know, I'm not going to ask you to uh, name the president that most closely affiliates himself with Ahab, but I'm sure each of you would have uh, your own uh, idea on that, but right, one of the things we're supposed to do as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is we're supposed to act like Elijah. Right? We are to speak prophetically to the government that is over us. And what is our main goal in speaking prophetically towards the government that is over us? Glory right? Bring glory to God, right? We desire that our nation should bow the knee to Christ, should declare Christ to be king, and should order itself so that the gospel can be preached freely, so that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ can meet without fear or warning or any kind of negative you know, you know, comeuppance upon itself. In fact, the Apostle Paul, of course, tells Timothy uh, to tell his church that they are to pray for the uh, king, for the government, for the civil magistrate, so that the civil magistrate will honor Christ. Now... Whenever we see kingdoms and governments that don't honor Christ, one of the things that always is made clear is that if you don't serve Christ, what are you going to do? If you are not with me, you are against me. Right? So every nation that has a government that is anti-Christ, it's going to be anti-church. It's going to bring persecution upon the faithful. Now that certainly has been happening in the northern kingdom. Right? Because the great sin of the northern kingdom is not just that it has wicked leaders, but the northern kingdom is worshiping a different god than the god of the south. Right, The god of the south is the god who's worshipped in Jerusalem, and the god of the north is the god who's worshipped in Samaria, right? or what's going to become Samaria, in, in Bethel. Now, as we come to chapter 18, you know, in chapter 18 we have Elijah bringing another message to Ahab. So let's go ahead and go to the first uh, about eight verses here of First uh, Kings 18. All right, so let's read together these first eight verses. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, Go, present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. Right, so remember, there has been a drought, and God is now sending Elijah with a message, and he was going to bring rain. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab, and there was a severe famine in Samaria. And Ahab had called Obadiah, who was in charge of his house, that is, Ahab's house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for so it was while Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah had taken 100 prophets and hidden them 50 to a cave, and had fed them with bread and water. And Ahab had said to Obadiah, Go into the land to all the springs of water and to all the brooks. Perhaps we may find grass to keep the horses and mules alive. 
so that we will not have to kill any livestock. So they divided the land between them to explore it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. Now as Obadiah was on his way, suddenly Elijah met him, and he recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is that you, my lord, Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go, tell your master, Elijah is here. So, this is the start uh, to the chapter, right? We know this chapter mostly for what we're going to be talking about here in a minute, right? The Mount Carmel victory. But the chapter begins with Elijah being sent by the Lord into the land to speak to Ahab, to promise him that there will be rain. Now, as Elijah presents this with Ahab, we hear that Ahab's called this fella Obadiah. Now, is this the same Obadiah as the book which is called Obadiah? No, right? It was written at a different time. It was written at a different uh, you know, you know, place in the world. And here we see that the name Obadiah means something simple. Right. What does verse 3 tell us that Obadiah's name means? Right. Remember, names in the Old Testament right, have, a, have a meaning. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think Obadiah means? In, in my Bible, there's a, a, a words in parentheses. Right, that's what the word, the word Obadiah means, right? Someone who fears the Lord greatly. Now, what does it mean to fear the Lord? Understand that we're not God and they are the God of God. That's right. To love the Lord your God, to fear Him with uh, your heart, to serve Him, to seek Him alone as the only God uh, of all gods. Now, do you think it was hard to be a servant in the house of Ahab if you feared the Lord greatly? Absolutely, Right. We have many examples in the Old Testament and in the New Testament where there are faithful Christians who are employed in less than, um, you know, wonderful you know, situations, right? We know that there were faithful men in Caesar's household, right? Because Paul tells us, right, that there are faithful Christians in the household of Caesar who came to visit him and who watched over him, protected him. Do you think it's helpful to have faithful men and women, even in a wicked government. Absolutely, right? I mean, we, when we pray for our civil magistrate, right, we're not just praying for the president, right? We're praying for the uh, secretary of agriculture, right? We're praying for the chief of staff. We're praying for bureaucrats, right? You know, I don't know how much you want to pray for bureaucrats, but, right, if they're part of the government, what should we do? We should pray for them, right? Because who knows? where God has placed in his providence a faithful, believing Christian. And what effect can a faithful believer have you know, in, in, a, in a wicked government? Be an example. Right? It can be an example, right? He can lead Bible studies, you know, just by witnessing his own holiness, right? You know, people can come to him and you know, things of this nature. I'm sure many of you have lived or have worked and maybe are working in a place that's less than ideal uh, to witness Christian faith. And, you know, one of the things that I've experienced in my own life with this back when I worked at FedEx Freight is that everybody knew, right, that I had graduated seminary and I was working there until, you know, I got my first call. Well, that opened several doors for men who were struggling with their marriage, struggling in life, to like come talk to me before shift or after shift and like just want to, you know, ask questions and advice. And, you know, not all those conversations, you know, you know, were <laughs> successful. I guess you put it that way. But, right, the Lord opened opportunities to do that. And we see with Obadiah that he was able to do something miraculous, right? He was able to save, you know, how many does it tell us? Now, a hundred prophets he was able to hide from the murderous reign of Ahab, right? You know, there you know, was a, there's been many movies and stuff made about the Holocaust, right? And again, one of the common themes in a lot of those movies, uh, what's probably the most famous one? Uh, Schindler's List, right? You know, remember Oscar Schindler, right? What was he? You know, he, he was a member of the Nazi party, right? I mean... He, it's not like he was you know, not involved in things, but you know, he was able to save a large number of Jews 
using his position, using his authority to provide help for those that he could help. Now, obviously he wasn't able to end the Holocaust, right? He wasn't able to stop the whole thing. But one of the witnesses we see here from Obadiah is that we need to be thankful, as the prophet Zechariah says, for the day of small things, right? You know, the Lord doesn't expect us to end world hunger, right? That's not our job. Right? What's our job as the church or even as individuals? Right? Preach the gospel. You know, when it comes to feeding hungry people, what do we need to do? Yeah, who feed who we can, right? So, you know, put stuff in the blessing box, right? Yeah, it may not seem like a big thing, but it's a huge thing to the family who doesn't have any food and is coming up here, especially in the last two or three days, and is in need of, of food, right? You have, you know, done a mighty work in the eyes of the Lord. You know, even when it seems mundane, right, we see the faithfulness of these kind of people that otherwise we wouldn't know anything about. But God and his... Ms. Mercy has decided to let us know about Obadiah. And so now Obadiah, as God and his providence is working, has now run into Elijah. Right? So Elijah has come. Uh, he, uh, you know, kind of, you know, this is one of these scenes in, in the Bible that reminds me like of a movie. Right? Um, because here's Obadiah walking around looking for, you know, grass and all that stuff. And he runs into Elijah. Right? And what is... What does Elijah say there in verse 8? Elijah is here, right? You know, it's, you can, you know, I mean, it almost seems like a Clint Eastwood movie, right? Where he's like a, you know, the no-name guy and he just comes into town and the, the you know, the owner of the, uh, the local uh, big ranch or whatever, right, has sent his minions out looking for the no-name guy and... One of the poor minions runs into Clint Eastwood, right? And that's all he says, right? Just let them know that so-and-so is here, right? And that's supposed to, like, strike fear into people, right? And there's a sense in which that's what's meant to happen here, right? Ahab is to be afraid that Elijah is here, right? Because who does Elijah speak for? For God, right? And if you are a God-fearing person, right, and God has sent a prophet to you, Right? What, what probably should be your emotion? <laughs> right? You, it should like kind of, you know, cause you to fall on your face a little bit, right? But that's what we see throughout the Bible with faithful believers, right? When Moses comes up on the mountain and sees the burning bush, what does Moses do? Right? He humbles himself, right? You know, God tells him to take his shoes off because he's on holy ground, right? We see this with Jesus as people are going around, right? People who are seeking Jesus, what do they always do when they come up on them? Right? They fall on their face, right? They, you know, show humility to Jesus, right? Now, you know, when this happens in the book of Acts and people come and fall on their face in front of Peter and, and, and others, what do they do? They tell them to get up, right? Because what do they say? I'm a man like you are, right? Elijah is a man like us, but... Elijah is, well, Elijah, right? Not, we aren't Elijah. Now, let's go ahead and, and start there at verse 9. So he, so he said, How have I sinned that you are delivering your servant in the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to hunt for you, that is Elijah. And when they said he is not here, he took an oath from the king or nation that they could not find you. And now you say, Go tell your master Elijah is here. It shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from you that the Spirit of the Lord will carry you to a place I do not know. So when I go and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. But I, but I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Was it not reported to my Lord what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, how I hid 100 men of the Lord's prophets, 50 to a cave, and fed them with bread and water? Now you say, go tell your master Elijah is here. He will kill me. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely present myself to him today. So Ahab went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have and your father's house has, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. And now therefore send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. 
So, you know, again, if, if this story was not in the Bible, all right, you'd think it had come off, you know, some kind of uh, Hollywood's you know, screen play, right? Because here again is the Clint Eastwood figure coming into town, telling everybody he's present, goes up to the strongest man in town and says, meet me at the mountain with how many? 450 prophets of Baal and 400 for Ashtoreth. So do math real quick. 850 prophets against me, right? 850 against one. Why is Ahab, I mean, why is Elijah so confident in what's getting ready to happen? He has God, he has God on his side, right? Uh, this probably didn't originate with Matthew Henry, uh, but Matthew Henry gets credit for the quote, you know, a man plus God, you know, is infinity, right? Because think about that quote for a second. What is God? Infinite, right? So if God's on your side, is there any army of the devil that can overthrow a single Christian? Well, no, right? In fact, we hear people say that literally in the Bible, right? You know, Jesus tells us that the gates of hell cannot, right, overthrow or withstand the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that last phrase is what makes all the difference, right? The church of Ben cannot stand up in the face of the devil, right? Because me by myself, even if I have 850 members of my cult, Right? Can I withstand the wiles of the devil? No. Right? Because I'm weak in the flesh. Right? That's one of the reasons why Paul condemns the church at Corinth. Right? Because what have they set up? Yeah. Followers of Paul. Right? Followers of Paulus. Even followers of Jesus. Right? And the problem is, is who should they be following? If Jesus Christ. Right? There's a reason why Paul leaves off the Christ part there. Right? Because even today, we have a lot of people who say they're a follower of Jesus, but what do they not keep? The commandments, right? You know, they, they talk about Jesus and me, right? You know, you know, Jesus is my friend, right? He's my pal, right? And, you know, he, you know, he knows me, you don't know me, all that kind of stuff, right? Well, the idea here again is that the reason why God is bringing judgment upon Ahab in the northern kingdom is because they've broken the commandments of the Lord, right? Not because they haven't listened to Elijah, not because they haven't done X, Y, or Z, right? The, the, the judgment is always for the same reason, because you do not follow the commandments of the Lord, right? So to show Ahab who's in charge, God has sent Elijah to, um, you know, to Ahab to bring this judgment to bear, right? Now, you know, this judgment is going to take an interesting form, right? So they come up to Mount Carmel. Now, what, what's, what's unique about Mount Carmel? It's, you know, the, the largest, tallest mountain, you know, in Israel, right? So what, what's significant about it being on the biggest mountain? That's right. Yeah, everybody can see what's getting ready to happen, right? There, it's, it's in public. It's on the highest stage, right? It can't be hidden from anybody, right? Everybody can see Mount Carmel uh, from where it is. It's kind of like if you've ever been out west, like in the northwest, it's kind of like Mount Rainier, right? You know, have you ever seen pictures of Seattle or Tacoma or that area? What's always in the background, right? Mount Rainier, right? And same thing with Tokyo, right? What's, what's always in the background uh, of pictures of Tokyo? Mount Fuji, right? You know, so there's this ever-present mountain, you know, that looks over Israel. And so that's where this judgment is going to take place. So let's go ahead and read the first nine verses here of the, of the, of the battle from 20 through 29. So Ahab, right, all confident in himself, sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. Now, one of the things I forgot to mention that's important to note here, when we hear all the children of Israel, are we meant to think that every single person in Israel is standing on the base of Mount Carmel? No. Um, you know, in fact, when we talked about the coronation of Rehoboam, one of the things that is made clear there is whenever we hear all the children of Israel present, 
We're meant to not think, again, the whole nation is there, but the representatives from every tribe are present, right? You know, how is our form of government in the United States supposed to work? We have representatives, right? In the House of Representatives, we have, you know, one per 500,000 or whatever the thing is now. And there's only 435 of them. We probably should have a lot more of them, but that's probably a whole other conversation. But what are they supposed to do while they're there? Represent the place that sent them, right? Are they supposed to necessarily vote their conscience? No, right? They're supposed to represent the interests of the people who sent them, right? Same thing with senators, right? Why, why does, why do we have a senate? To represent the whole state. Represent the whole state, right? There's a reason why, you know, the 17th Amendment was one of the worst decisions ever made, uh, because the 17th Amendment made the direct election of senators. Senators now are a popular office, which is what the House of Representatives are, right? The, the Senate is supposed to be made up of men who have been elected by the, the um, state legislature to represent the interests of the state, right? Now, when these representatives are coming to the, um, to the Mount Carmel, right, they're there to represent their tribes. And so the, the idea is, is that they are then to take what they see and bring it back where? Right to their tribe, right? They are to bring and tell them, hey, God's more powerful than Baal, right? That's what's supposed to happen, right? So in verse 20, so Ahab uh, sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between the two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull, lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then all, then you call in the name of your gods, I will call in the name of, my, of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Let's go ahead and stop there for a second. So... This is the stake of the game, as it were, right? You have the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Ashtaroth, and you have the prophet of God, Elijah, right? And so the way that this is going to work is that Elijah tells them, right, give me two bulls. You pick the bull you want, right? This is kind of like an alpha move, right? Yeah, he's, he's saying, you know, you pick the one you want. I'll take, I'll take whichever one, right? Because the idea is, is he wants to testify that this game's not rigged, right? I mean, it is rigged because God alone is, is, is the true God. But, right, the idea here is that you're to take the bull, and what are you to do with the bull first? You're to, you're to choose it and then cut it to pieces, right? Now, you're not supposed to cut it into, like, you know, uh, into filet mignon and T-bone and, and things like that, right? You're not, you're not you know, butchering the cow, right? What you're doing is the exact same thing that Abraham did in Genesis 17. Remember when Moses, or when Abraham cuts the bull in half, what is what does he do? Well, watch between it, right? And then what does God do? You know, passes between the same bull. Now, what what's that supposed to represent? Right, the covenant, right? The promise that has been made between God and his people. So what Elijah is doing here is very directly calling upon the Abrahamic promise, right? And the Abrahamic promise is very simple. I am your God and you are my people, right? So Elijah is saying, okay, we're going to see who God, you know, who's on God's side here, right? And we're going to invoke Abraham and Moses and David, right, the covenant heads, to witness against this. So they set it up, right, they put it on the wood with no fire under it, and so the people answered and said, it is well spoken, right? So they accept the terms of the, uh, of the conflict. So let's go ahead and read there, verse 25. 
Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bow for yourselves, pray at first, for you are many, and call the name of your God, put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them, and they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning eve until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no answer, no voice. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's sleeping, and must be awakened. They cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances, until the blood gushed out on them. And when the midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Uh, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. So, again, it's one of my favorite stories in the Bible, right? Because... No, there are few instances in the Bible that witness to the insanity of unbelief than this passage, right? Because at the end of the day, what's the biggest difference between Jehovah God and Baal? There is no Baal, there is no Baal right? That's the biggest difference between Jehovah and Baal. However, right, why does Elijah let them go first? Right? To show the ridiculousness every time. Right? One of the things, of course, about God in the promise he made to Abraham is that he would always be with them. Right? Whether they are in Egypt, whether they are in Babylon, whether they're in Clover, South Carolina, or whether they're in Mount Carmel. Right? God is always present with his people. But where is Baal? He's on a trip. He's asleep. Right? He doesn't care about you. Right? Um, you know, our Bibles kind of uh, clean it up a little bit, right? But they say basically he's on his throne, right? That, that he must be otherwise engaged. And, you know, so he mocks them and then they start doing what? Cutting themselves. Now, one of the things the law of God says that we are never to do is what? Cut ourselves, right? And, and why are we not to cut ourselves? We are not to shed our own blood, right? Because one of the requirements of the law is whose blood must be shed for our sin. Well, Jesus is, but uh, you know, in the old covenant, right? It was the bull or the lamb or the you know the unblemished whatever, right? And because the idea always is is that we cannot save ourselves, right? We cannot do anything to earn the favor of the living God. There must always be a substitute for that, right? And so cutting yourself, shedding your own blood, again, is saying that you can do those things, right? That's, that's one of the reasons why we're not to do that. Also, we're not to do that because it's dumb, right? <laughs> you know, we're, we're not to do things, you know, and, and it is true to say, right, God does not desire us ever to be fools, and everything that the prophets of Baal are doing here is foolish, right? So they do all these things. Elijah says, okay, no one answered. It's my turn. Right? So in verse 31, it says, And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel should be your name. Then with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two uh, says of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bowl in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, Fill four water pots of water, pour it on the burnt offering, and on the wood. Why is he um, adding to the difficulty of this, right? Because it wasn't required of the priests of Baal that they pour water on everything. But, again, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand, you know, does pouring water on wood help it catch fire? No. Why do you pour wood water on stuff? So he can show how powerful God is. That's right, to show how powerful God is, right? That this is not a magic trick, right? Again, that he has not rigged the game, right? He is upping the level of difficulty. So we see Elijah uh, do all these things. And then it says, uh, then he said, do it a second time. Did it a second time. He said, do it a third time. Do it a third time. So three times they go about pouring water on the altar. Right, so the water ran all around the altar. He also filled the trench with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah, 
Uh, the prophet came near and said, The Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust. It was licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. Right. Why did the prophets get executed? Well, so wouldn't, that's certainly part of it. What did the commandments require should happen to false prophets? That they should be executed. Right? Because God does not mess around with false teaching. Right? And you know, whether or not that should continue today, again, I'll, I'll leave up to your own conscience, but the teaching here is pretty clear. That if you falsely call in the name of the Lord, that judgment will come down upon you. You will receive the due reward of your sin. So, Everything that Elijah does here is in keeping with the commandments of the Lord. Right? You notice again, as he offers the things up, notice how he offers them up. And it came to pass, the, and start there at verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Right? Elijah waited until it was the time of the evening sacrifice. Because you know, while the time we worship in the new covenant is not set by statute... It was in the old covenant, right? So could Elijah just offer up sacrifice anytime he felt like? No, right? The law was very clear. So he waited for the time of the evening sacrifice, right? Because again, Elijah is witnessing that the power is not of him, but it's of God, right? That his obedience to God is full and that he's not going to do anything that God has not told him to do. You know, because the temptation for us would have been to call on God when? As soon as possible, right? Because how quickly do you want to show your enemies that they are your enemies? <laughs> right? As soon as you can pour the coals on their head, you want to be doing it. But what are we to do even in the new covenant? Right? What does Paul say in the book of Hebrews? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Right? You know, again... Elijah is witnessing to these things. And as he comes to God in verse 36, notice how he approaches him. He says, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and I have done all these things according to your word. Right? And normally when we hear the God of Abraham, Isaac, what name is used? Jacob. Right? Why does he use the name Abraham? Or, uh, uh, I, uh, I, Israel here. That's right. You know, because remember, when did Jacob get the name Israel? You know, what, what was the event that happened right before he got the name Israel? That's right, when he wrestled with God, right? And in a sense, right, what has Israel been doing since the death of Solomon? Wrestling with God, right? Now, has Israel been winning the, the wrestling match? No, right? So part of what's being witnessed here is the fact that even though Israel is in rebellion against God, who is still their God? God, right? Jehovah God is still their God, right? So invoking the covenant is testifying to the fact that even though when we are in rebellion against God, who has not forsaken us? My like God, right? So, you know, the mercy that God is showing to Israel is that he hasn't destroyed them off the face of the earth, right? And he's giving them opportunity to see his power, his love, his grace in the sinners, even in the day of this judgment. So, you know, he, he does all these things. The fire comes down from the Lord, consumes the burnt sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dust, looks up the water was in the trench. Now, how hot do you think fire has to be to consume dust? Yeah, pretty hot, right? So again, the totality of the judgment is made clear here. Now, you know, after all this happens, right, they kill the prophets of Baal, we get the last little section. So let's go ahead and read 41 through 46. 
Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to top of Carmel. Then he bowed down the ground, put his face on his knees, and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and, and said, There is nothing. And seven times he said, Go again. Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, There is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, Go up, say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot, go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind. There was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Now, you know, we may or may not have some experience with uh, uh, the image uh, that is given here, right? A small little cloud off on the sea turns into what? Yeah, a big and flat cloud that brings wind and rain, right? So again, God's providence bringing this passage on this day. Now... As the things are coming, we hear that Ahab is supposed to go tell everybody about what God has done. Now, we have the benefit of knowing the rest of the story. What does Ahab do? He goes the other way, right? And that's why God sends Elijah ahead of him, right? Because you cannot escape from the word of the Lord, right? That's the image that's meant to be given here, is that just because Ahab doesn't want this to be so... Doesn't mean you can just hide your head in, in in the sand and act like God doesn't exist and God had won a great victory at Carmel, right? Now, as Ahab is running away, does Ahab ever escape the presence of the Lord? No. Which is ironic considering who has he been trying to get to come? Baal, right? He's been trying to get Baal to show up. Baal never shows up, but God never leaves. Right? There's, a, there, there's a picture there that we're meant to see. And you know, we kind of come to a close on that today. Um, you know, next week when we come, we'll be in chapter 19, so we'll get to see the rest of this, this story. But you know, the, the main kind of you know, statement, however you want to phrase that, for the 18th chapter book of 1 Kings is that God is real and Baal is not. And if that's the case, who should we worship and serve? God. Now, it's probably the message of every chapter in the Bible, but it's expressly pronounced here in 1 Kings 18. And we'll go ahead and close there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for this day and this time, especially opportunities to remind us of your covenant blessings, the way that you have made a promise to our forefathers in the faith, and how you routinely show us that you are the one true and living God, and that we should serve you in love and fear and by the grace of the shed blood of the Lamb. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.